Hello, my name is Mark Stevens, and I'm a plant-based sport and exercise nutrition coach. I'm here today to talk to you about sports, exercise, and avocados, or how to work out on a vegan diet. Now, before I go any further at all, I'd like to point out that the principles of training on a vegan or plant-based diet are exactly the same as those if you were training on any other diet. There's nothing particularly different or special about the way that you need to eat. You just need to make sure that you cover all of your requirements for your particular training plan. So before we get stuck into that, let's just get a little inspired and see what you can actually achieve on a plant-based diet. These characters are probably fairly well known to you um, if you're a vegan or plant-based person yourself. If not, you may have seen them in Game Changers. But we have Rich Roll, the uh, Ultra Man, uh, Scott Jurek, the Ultra Runner, Fiona Oakes, the Ultra Adventure and Marathon Racer, I think would be a good way to describe her, and uh, Patrick Baboumian, who I'm just going to say is Strongman, uh, and at the top of his field in many Strongman type events. There are also some more well known, perhaps, uh, athletes, and uh, Novak Djokovic. Lewis Hamilton, who's a fantastic advocate for the vegan and plant-based movement. Uh, Venus Williams. Uh, Adam Hansen, the pro cyclist, who's, I think, switching to pro triathlon. Uh, and also Lionel Messi, who, I believe, during the football season, is plant-based, recognising that uh, this allows him to perform and recover better. Okay, so we've looked at some athletes who are quite clearly at the very top of their respective fields. And a plant-based or vegan diet doesn't seem to be holding them back at all. In fact, some of them would argue quite strongly that actually being plant-based is a part of their advantage over their competitors. Uh, and quite a lot of them cite the ability to recover from training efforts faster than they ever could before, which allows them to get out training again and therefore improve and build on those gains. If we look at some of the studies that have been done on plant-based diets, uh, and spot and then have a look to see if there are any advantages there. There are perhaps some that have been identified. I'm just going to touch on those before we go any further. Plant-based diet is high in antioxidants and basically when you're training you're causing oxidative stress within your body. Your body is actually damaging itself and you're breaking it down to rebuild and adapt stronger. If your diet's full of antioxidants you can actually combat this oxidative stress more effectively and get out there again sooner. Hot plant-based diets are also full of flavanols, and flavanols are associated with a higher VO2 max score. VO2 max being the ability to, to use oxygen around the body effectively, especially during um, peak efforts. So clearly that would be an advantage uh, for an athlete. Plant-based diets are naturally low in saturated fat, and this aids with blood fluidity. So better blood fluidity, better blood flow. You're getting oxygen to your muscles where it can burn energy and create power and get work done. So again, a potential advantage. I also want to talk about the beetroot effect. Um, this isn't the effect of you going red when you've overdone it in the gym or you've run a little bit too far too quickly. But more than the case of beetroots contain dietary nitrates um, along with some other vegetables as well. And it's actually been found that these uh, nitrates can increase blood flow by relaxing the arteries and the uh, blood capillaries. Uh, finally, I think we should probably note as well that a plant-based diet is naturally very high in uh, carbohydrates. And the carbohydrates are the principal energy source for all efforts uh, from low to high, but specifically in, in the context of sport and exercise for intense efforts. Um, you're really looking at your glycogen, your carbohydrate stores, to uh, power those. So what are the nutritional requirements of a training diet? Well essentially there are two key elements here. One is to provide energy so that you can actually undertake your workout. Uh, and the other is to provide the building blocks necessary, the nutrients for your body to actually recover from that training session. After all, training isn't about the amount of work that you can do, the amount of workouts that you can fit in. Training is about how many of those workouts you can effectively recover from, and diet, nutrition, is a key part of that. So if I look at energy first, and I've split this into two categories, 
the first I've termed standby mode, although I think it's probably more correct to call it your basal metabolic rate. This is essentially the energy that you need when you're just sitting still doing essentially nothing. However, your body is busy functioning. It's digesting food, you're breathing, your heart is beating, blood is flowing around your body. It's the energy that you need simply to live. The other category that I've put forward is activity mode. Um, this is a, basically any kind of uh, physical activity at all. It doesn't have to be sport and exercise. It could be walking to the shops, running for the bus, doing the housework, whatever. It's all movement and it's all additional energy that we require over and above that base rate. So how can we calculate how much energy we need to get through a typical day? Well, we have to combine those two elements, your basal metabolic rate and your activity calories. Basal metabolic rate can be calculated. It's normally a function of, or it's primarily a function of body weight, height, age, sex. There are other factors as well, but they're probably the principal ones. Um, there are several uh, equations that enable us to do this. Um, but I've actually gone for a very simple one. It's okay for a kind of benchmark figure, I think, for most of us. And you can simply calculate your basal metabolic rate by multiplying your body weight, as measured in kilos, by 24, if you're a man, or uh, 22, if you're a female. And that'll give you a rough idea. Now we need to think about all those activity calories. So we consider the kind of day we have or the kind of week. How many times do you train during the course of a week? How active is your work? Is it basically desk-based, sitting behind a desk? Or are you climbing scaffold all day? We factor that in and come up with a factor called the uh, physical activity level. And that's basically a, a number which is going to be somewhere between one and two for most people um, and you apply that to your basic metabolic rate so a sedentary person is going to have a low physical activity level uh, near one uh, whereas a very active person would be pushing up into sort of 1.7 1.8 and beyond now so if we multiply your basic basal metabolic rate by that physical activity level we end up with a daily caloric need so that's basically how many calories you need every day to fuel both your essential and normal body functions, your basal metabolic rate, uh, and any activity that you put on top of that. Now bear in mind that this is kind of an average that you take across uh, a period of day. This doesn't mean that this is the amount of energy that you need each and every day, but this is a kind of averaged out uh, amount so that you can get some kind of feel for how many calories you need to consume in order to sustain your training plan. Before we move on from talking about energy and calorie requirements, I just thought I'd throw this table up which uh, lists a few common exports and exercises and the rate at which calories are burned. Now obviously these are again a generalisation and they vary from person to person. Uh, probably the biggest factor is body weight and heavier people will generally use more energy to do uh, a same task as a lighter person. However, they give us a kind of indication of the kind of uh, calorie burn you could expect for some of these activities. They start at around 250 at the low end of things for a very gentle cycle, right? Uh, up to maybe a thousand calories an hour for more intense efforts, um, sort of running at sort of 15 kilometers an hour thereabouts. And if you can sustain that for an hour, then you're going to be well up into a thousand calories. Generally though, you can see that most activities, most physical activities are in the range of around five to 700 calories an hour. So energy, where do we get this energy from? I'm gonna talk about it in terms of macronutrients, carbohydrates, protein, and fat. Now, carbohydrate is the most important macronutrient to talk about in terms of energy source uh, in the context of uh, sports and exercise. Um, Carbohydrates are stored in the body as glycogen, uh, both in the muscles and in the liver. Now, different people can store different quantities, but generally uh, we're limited to around 2,000 calories maximum uh, when we're completely topped up. So if you think back to our activity table, which shows you how many calories might be burned during different activities, 
then you can imagine that if we're burning eight or nine hundred calories an hour, then as our exercise um, or training session moves towards the two hour mark or quite possibly beyond, then we're quite likely depleted our glycogen stores. At this point, the body will switch to burning fat predominantly. And it's at this point also that you'll notice a drop in performance because you can't sustain the same intensity of activity while fat burning as you can when burning glycogen. Now the other thing to note about uh, glycogen is that there's a limited rate at which you can replace it. So um, this is generally based around body weight and I think a rule of thumb which is easy to remember is that you can generally replace around one gram of carbohydrate per kilogram of body weight per hour. So what does that mean? Well, if I weigh 80 kilos, that means that in any hour, providing I eat sufficient carbohydrate-rich food, I could at most look to replenish around 80 grams of carbohydrate. Now you'll note from that, because you're probably already thinking ahead, that actually that means that I can burn far more calories an hour than I can replace, and that's absolutely true. So when we're talking about fueling our exercise sessions, uh, and especially for longer sessions, which are perhaps taking two, three, four, five hour sessions, then what we're trying to do is actually just stave off that point at which we crash and run out of glycogen. So think about sort of runners hitting the wall or uh, cyclists getting the hunger knock. That's the effect of running out of glycogen. So. Uh, for a typical athlete, um, the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, recommend that a training diet will probably include around, well, between three to seven grams of key, uh, three to seven grams of carbohydrate per kilo of body weight per day for a moderately intensive training program. And if you're training very intensively, and we're talking at a kind of uh, a real sort of athlete level, pro athlete level, then 7 to 12 grams um, perhaps be more in order. It all relates to uh, the intensity of your training program. We touched on fat. Um, two, the two things you probably need to know about fat is uh, it can power us through our lower intensity efforts. That's why some endurance athletes will actually train to try to adapt to use fat for a, a sort of long duration relatively low intensity efforts. Don't get me wrong, those guys are putting out a lot of power, uh, but it is possible to train yourself to actually uh, use fat at those sort of levels of activity. We're not gonna get into the details of that. Um, but the other thing about fat is that we store, relatively speaking, uh, huge quantities of it. So, whereas typically you might be able to store 2,000 calories of glycogen at any one time within the body, uh, most of us, however lean we are, will have tens of thousands of calories of fat around us. Um, we should also talk about protein as well, which is generally more associated with growth and rebuilding, obviously, and we'll come on to that. But protein has also actually been found to be used by the, by the body as an energy source. And this is associated, or it's been found to be towards the end of longer duration, high intensity activities. So perhaps towards the end of a two hour session where the body will actually start to metabolize protein. Now this is worth keeping in mind in that what we're essentially doing there is burning lean tissue and burning our muscles to use as fuel, uh, which for a small amount of time or in small quantities is sustainable but obviously far from ideal if you're training to actually grow bigger and stronger. So this is another reason why it's really important to make sure that you're fueling yourself as effectively as possible and making sure that you're not putting your body into a, sort of a crisis where it's actually going to start to cannibalize itself for fuel. Okay, with respect to repair and growth, the other requirement of a training diet, um, protein is the principal macronutrient for growth and renewal of cells. So we need to make sure that we have sufficient so that we can actually recover from our training sessions. Now, again, there are a couple of things to bear in mind with respect to protein. 
One is there's a limited amount that you can actually assimilate uh, from any one meal time. Uh, and study have shown this to be up to around 30 grams of protein for a meal. Uh, much beyond that, and the body's kind of unable to actually process more. Um, the other thing to, to note is that the requirement for protein is a function of both body weight, so the bigger you are, the more protein you require, and also the intensity of working out as well. So again, the more intensively you work out, the more uh, muscle breakdown that you're going through, then the more protein you need to, to build back up again. Uh, the IOC uh, figures for protein requirement for an athlete, they say between 1.2 to 1.7 grams per kilo of body weight. So again, obviously it depends on the individual and also the point, uh, the kind of training that they're undertaking, the intensity of their training. It's also worth bearing in mind that, uh, relatively speaking, uh, beginners to exercise or, or some kind of or some sports actually require slightly more protein than uh, someone who's uh, been training for a longer period of time. So finally, in the context of repair and growth, I'm going to mention fat. Fat is essential to many of the body's processes and also to the rebuilding and renewal of cells. So that's why it's important that fat is a part of a healthy diet uh, for an athlete or indeed for all of us. So we talked a little bit about um, what we might eat or the kind of quantities of food that we might require in order to uh, power our training plan. But there are other factors to consider as well, including when should we eat? What should we eat before training, during training, uh, post training? And we just touched on that quite briefly. There's quite a, a lot of information there to potentially talk about. But basically, if you bear in mind that for pre-training, what you're aiming to do is to provide your body with sufficient energy to get through that training event or that workout. Now, I know you can work out in a fasted state, and that's kind of a different topic for another day. But generally speaking, you'll be wanting to uh, fuel up to get yourself through a workout. For a longer period of training, that maybe lasts uh, to approaching two hours or more, then we really need to think about what we're going to eat during that training event. What we're trying to do there is to top up our glycogen store so that we can continue to work uh, at a, an intense rate and not crash and revert to burning fat specifically. Obviously there are circumstances where you might want to burn fat, but what I'm talking about is actually training at a fairly intensive level. So when we're doing that, we need to think about taking food with us and uh, uh, making sure that it's carbohydrate rich. The other thing to bear in mind is that if you're working out for two hours, three hours or four hours, don't wait until the second hour to start eating. The moment you start training is the moment that you start to burn glycogen and so that's the point at which you also want to start to replenish it, bearing in mind that it's, there's a limited quantity that we can actually replace during any given time. So as you set off, you should really already be starting to think about what you're going to eat uh, in the first hour of exercise. We should also say something about post-training, so what do we eat after a training session? Um, two things that we're really looking to replace there, and in terms of macronutrients specifically, protein and carbohydrate. Uh, studies have shown that to have a, a meal or come some kind of snack immediately after training session, which includes a combination of protein and carbohydrate, is a good way to actually kickstart the body's um, processes of actually rebuilding after training. With respect to protein, we're looking at around 20 grams or maybe slightly more and for carbohydrate to actually start to replenish the glycogen that we've used through our training session. Now it used to be thought that there was a fairly finite window immediately after training that you needed to eat within a sort of half hour of finishing a session. Uh, more recent studies have shown that's not necessarily the case and providing that you eat well for the rest of the day um, and make sure that you do actually eat to recover, then uh, you'll be fine. I think the only exception to that rule is if you're doing some kind of uh, multi-event sport where perhaps after the first round or the first race, 
you're going to be racing again later that day, performing or competing later that day, then in that circumstance you really do need to concentrate on replenishing your energy stores as quickly as possible. Okay, so we've talked a lot about macronutrients, protein, carbohydrate, fat, we've talked about uh, food in terms of energy and what that might look like and we've talked about that like, sort of regrowth and, and how we actually rebuild ourselves. But what does it actually look like in terms of real food? I think sometimes it's easy to talk about the sort of science of it all and actually what does it really mean? Uh, nobody sits down to a plate of carbohydrate or a bowl of protein. Uh, we eat food. So I thought what I'd do next is just run through some example plant-based uh, foods that I might eat during the course of a day and just so you get a feeling for the context and the kind of foods that you might eat and how they stack up against the kind of training diet. So uh, for relative ease I've chosen some meals that uh, would suit a person, a, a person of around 80 kilos, it's actually me, um, who does a, a moderate amount of training so I'm probably training in some sense, most days, uh, possibly on my bike for an hour, an hour and a half, maybe two, do some strength work as well. So I suppose uh, not an athlete by any stretch of the imagination, but an active person. So let's just have a quick look at some of the foods that they might eat. Starting off with breakfast, uh, oats I've got here, um, great start to the day. What you're going to see in all of these examples is a good variety of foods as well. So we've got oats here, I've got my fortified soy milk, I've got the fortified soy milk because it also contains B vitamins and calcium. But uh, ground linseeds, fruit, always still good to get our fruit and vegetables, um, and also pumpkin seeds, glass of orange juice. You see in the corner of these slides, I've also um, kept a tally of the energy value and the macronutrient value. I don't want anyone to get too hung up on those, but at the end of this particular example day, I'm just going to top them up and show them how they actually stack up against uh, training nutrition guidelines. Okay, a mid-morning snack. This is a, a peanut butter and banana on toast. It's a combination of um, so whole, whole grain toast and peanut butter, so a good protein combination there. Got some fruit in there in terms of our banana as well, plenty of carbs too. So this might be something that I might choose to eat perhaps after I've been out on my bike for an hour and a half or so, and I actually just want to top up my energy reserves. Uh, this could be a potential lunch, a chickpea smash sandwich. Basically smashed up chickpeas with a few vegetables as well. Uh, in a sandwich, a little bit of mayonnaise as well. Um, I mean, this could equally be beans on toast or any other fairly standard kind of uh, lunch type snack that you could imagine. But you can see that what it's providing there is a fairly good range of uh, energy and protein. In the afternoon, I've gone for a, a, a green smoothie there. Uh, I find smoothies personally quite a nice way to, to up my my vegetable count, this one's got kale in it, a few dates and apple. Uh, to be honest, it's quite surprising just how much fruit and vegetable you can get into a smoothie uh, if you're feeling the need to actually increase your count. And if we're looking at uh, variety as being one of the most important things of a plant-based diet, then it might be quite a good thing to incorporate. Also quite high in energy as well, another, what's the, around 600 calories there because it's got a handful of nuts in it. Uh, and also you see it's got a reasonable protein count as well. You notice that all of these meals that I've talked about so far have a, uh, an amount of pro uh, a reasonable amount of protein in them, bearing in mind that we can only actually process a relatively small amount in only one meal. It's better to spread that throughout the course of a day over several meals than try to eat all of your protein in one go in say your evening meal. Okay, evening meal here, we've got some uh, steamed rice, tofu, steamed vegetables, um, stir-fried vegetables as well. So again, a good sort of rounded source of carbohydrates for energy and uh, protein for uh, cell renewal and regrowth. So we've looked at some meals there that I might typically eat during the course of a day. How do they stack up as far as a training diet goes? Well, um, if I had all those meals together, I'd come to around 2,800 calories, which for a person of my size and weight, 
um, would be suitable for someone who's kind of moderately active. So I think that fits the bill really. Uh, carbohydrates, it came into um, total a little over 300 grams. And again, that kind of fits with the IOC uh, guidance that we talked about earlier. We're looking at three to seven grams per kilo of body weight. Uh, that actually works out about four grams per kilo of body weight for me. So I'm in the right kind of ballpark there. And then finally protein, if we look at the amount of protein, it was close to 100 grams during the course of that day, spread out over several meals, so that being the ideal way to take on protein. Uh, and that works out to around 1.2 grams per kilo of body weight. So again, for someone who's moderately active and is more of a, I'd describe some more of a, an endurance type athlete than a strength athlete, then that's in the right kind of ballpark as far as the IOC are concerned and other uh, sports studies. Right, well done on getting this far. Um, just a couple of uh, final points that I wanted to make before we wrap this particular talk up. Um, first off, nutrition becomes more critical with increased frequency, duration and intensity of exercise. So the more training that you do and the more intense your program, then the more you really need to take a good look at your nutrition and make sure that it's adequately fueling what you're trying to do and that you're giving your body uh, its best potential to actually recover from that training, adapt and, and grow stronger. Uh, the second point I would like to raise is that plant-based diets tend to have a lower uh, calorie density than other perhaps meat and dairy based diets. So keep this in mind as well. I know that I've talked quite a little bit about uh, energy deficiency and being in deficit because perhaps you're training uh, hard and you're not eating sufficient calories. And bear in mind that uh, as far as plant-based and vegan considerations go, Plant-based diets are of a lower calorie density, so make sure that you do include some foods that are of a, a higher calorie density and that you are adequately uh, fueling your training regime. Uh, finally, I'd say plan ahead and prepare accordingly. I think a lot of athletes have a, a very detailed training plan when it comes to workouts. Uh, they know when they're going to go to the gym this week, they know when they're going to do their long run next week. Uh, you might have a three month program heading towards some event. However, they haven't necessarily got the same kind of nutrition plan. So what are you eating in the days leading up to that event? What food are you taking with you? What are you eating after a training event? Have you got it with you? Is it in your training bag? Have you got food at home that is the food that you actually require when you get in tired and hungry and you're really needing something to eat? Nutrition is so important um, when it comes to uh, training effectively. The actual workouts themselves are only a part of uh, becoming a better athlete. You need to also feed yourself properly. And there are other things that come into the equation as well. Managing your stress levels, getting enough sleep, those sorts of things. So keep that in mind. Okay, um, a summary. Uh, a healthy vegan diet, a plant-based diet, is going to provide you with all the nutrition that you need to achieve your training plan. World-class athletes do it, you can do it too. No amount of training is going to overcome a poor diet, and if your diet is deficient in any way, then at best you're going to not be getting all the gains and benefits from your training plan that really are due to you. So, keep that in mind. Follow a nutrition plan that's built around your requirements, not someone else's. Now, it might sound like a really obvious thing to say, but I think this is particularly applicable when we look at some of the products, sport nutrition type products that are sold to us in the context of what perhaps professional athletes, bodybuilders and the like are doing and achieving. Um, for most of us, it's not really applicable at all. And so you want to make sure that your nutrition plan suits you and suits your training. Finally, I'd say focus on plant-based whole foods for optimum health. Look for variety, look for foods which are relatively unprocessed or not processed at all. And I don't think you're going to go very far wrong. Um, I appreciate I've had to get through quite a lot of information quite quickly. 
hopefully some of it will prompt you to go and have a look into it in a little more detail. I've included references on the next slide uh, so that you can perhaps look into some of those studies for yourself. But um, I wish you all the very best with your own training plans and whatever your sporting and exercise aspirations are for this year. And also with your nutrition plans too. And if you'd like to find out more about plant-based living and plant-based health, then certainly look up the Plant-Based Health Professionals UK or contact myself if you'd like to talk more about sports and exercise and plant-based coaching. Thank you.